Okay, so um, let me start. So there are two changes to this um, session. Probably you noticed already the third paper uh, has been withdrawn, so we have two papers. I will still shoot for 30 minutes, uh, but I will be a little bit relaxed about the 30 minute um, time allocation, but I will not go over too much. Uh, the second change is slight change in title. The program says managing a polarized structural change, but um, same paper, but we are hoping that this title works better. Okay. So we at least get people puzzled more. Horizontal and vertical polarization. Is there too much echo? I didn't say anything important. Okay, so this is joint work with Tim Lee. Um, he was around. I told him not to come in. Okay, so he's hiding there. Okay. So he's at Mannheim. He's moving to Toulouse um, next year. So what do we do with the puzzling title? So we'd like to propose a new, a new class of model for macro uh, that's task and occupation based. Okay, let's, does it work better? Okay, good. Microphones just do not like me very much. So, um, so, okay, so we are, have a new model. So we want to think about just workers, not as some skill, uh, but have a, this different categories of workers working for different occupations. That's what we want to have. So this task-based models, some versions of it have been uh, used in international trade, but we actually add a little more to that. Okay, so the idea is that people here have different skills, but instead of having a one-dimensional skill, we're gonna have two-dimensional skills. People have a managerial skills, kind of think of a Lucas span of control type model, and people have the skill as a non-managerial worker. For the rest of the talk, we're gonna have a managers and workers, and whenever I say worker, we're just talking about the non-manager workers. And we're gonna have multiple occupations among workers. As a one-dimensional worker skill, uh, because of the way we structured how different occupations are different, people will sort into different occupations. This will be, become clearer when we actually see the model. And what do we do with this new model? Why is it useful for? So we're gonna talk about um, routinization. What it is is some work occupations see a lot more of a productivity growth over the last 35 years than other occupations. And this, just one thing happening, can explain three different facts. Two of these facts are fairly well known, but typically not considered in the same framework. And then um, the third fact is fairly new. So the first fact is job and wage polarization. Did something happen to the microphones? I mean, I feel, is it okay? Okay. This is uh, what's wrong with the technological change in this occupation. So, okay, good. So, um, there are three things we'd like to explain with just one exogenous force changing the. Okay. So, one is job and wage polarization. I show you the graph that's uh, popularized by David Otter and company. And structure change, a new, uh, very old fact in macro. So I don't have to say much about it. And then to that, we're gonna add another fact called the vertical polarization. We're gonna look at what happens to managers relative to what happens to uh, workers. And there are some interesting facts. So we even have a trademark uh, on it. It's a new fact. So let me start by showing you some graphs. So again, there are three facts I'll be talking about. This is a fairly well-known uh, employment polarization picture. So just focus on the bars for now. So uh, 
this is 11 occupations. Far right is manager. The others are no manager or workers occupations at one digit level of occupation classification. And then the area of each bar shows the change in uh, employment share of that occupation in the economy. So if you read it properly, the low level, far left, low level services has increased by about three percentage point in terms of the share in total occupation uh, structure of the economy. And you look at uh, the third bar, the tall one going down, that's um, machine operators. Uh, that has been going down by about six percentage point in terms of its employment share in the total uh, occupation structure. And you see the picture. You kind of see why it's called the polarization because the occupations which are sorted by their average wage of occupation in 1980, so the far right managers uh, have highest average wage and low skill services have lo uh, lowest average wage in 1980, you're going to see that the far ends of the occupation actually increase the occupation share. Uh, the middle kind of doesn't do as well, although sales and tech, uh, sales and uh, technicians actually do somewhat better. So this is a polarization figure. And the dotted line, that's actually the original version from Auto and Dawn, which we actually extend to 2010. Uh, they ended in 2005. So, so there's a similar pattern at a much finer occupation classification. You see the U shape, the polarization pattern, and then we're going to focus on the bars, uh, which is more aggregated at the one digit level. And then similar pattern actually exists for wages. So you sort occupation again by 1980 average wage, and you look at how much uh, of the average wage increase in each occupation. You kind of see in the far ends, average wage increase will be more than in the middle. Um, again, technicians and sales being a little bit of exception in the middle. So that's a little bit weaker pattern in wage polarization, but this is fairly well uh, established empirical analyst. Okay. So looking at this picture, Otto and John hypothesized that, oh, maybe it has something to, uh, something to do with routinization. So the idea is that some jobs are more easily codifiable so that they can be more easily replaced with the machines and computers. So over time, those jobs actually shrink in the occupational structure, and other jobs that's harder to replace the machines, kind of what we do, uh, actually the implement share increases. So there was a hypothesis. It's not, the relationship is not, so the bars you are seeing here is actually the uh, routinization index, RTI, which uh, Otto and Don actually uh, constructed. Um, well, actually, in different papers, uh, Otto and Asimoglu and Otto, Levy and Morin, and uh, different people have constructed. So there's some relationship between the occupations with the high routine index, actually see a little bit more of um, decrease in employment share, but it's not as tight. I come back to this picture at the end when we actually propose a better measures of routinization. The first fact is done. The second fact, there was polarization, and the second fact is structural change. It's fairly well known. Blue is manufacturing, red is services. So manufacturing, implement share, and value of the share in the economy has been falling. Services uh, has been rising in those dimensions. Okay. So one thing we do is that, okay, these are typically thought in a very different uh, literatures. We're going to combine the two facts. Is there some connection? And not surprisingly, at some cursory level of evaluation, there's some correlation. So we are looking at this employment share change picture, but now by sectors. Not surprisingly, so blue is manufacturing, red is services. Not surprisingly, manufacturing tended to have negative signs because manufacturing has been shrinking overall. And uh, red services has been rising because their employment share has been increasing. But you see really interesting occupation uh, polarization pattern implement in terms of employment shares. Uh, especially, it is the manufacturing jobs in the middle, like machine, operati machine operators and transportation workers and um, administrative support, the second bar, that has been really tanking. And then a lot of rise actually is concentrated in the services, especially in the far ends. So there's some connection. So this is going to be one ingredient to what we're doing. And in some sense, it's a small empirical contribution in the sense that pe people often conjecture, but maybe there's some connection between this structural change and polarization. We kind of show it, but it's, this is not the main empirical uh, contribution. So the new fact, the third fact that was fairly new is what we call vertical polarization. So we're going to 
because auto and companies thought of managers as one of the many different occupations, but we're gonna, we kind of approach from the Lucas Spanner control model, and then we think of managers as a very special occupation, and actually there are interesting facts going on in the background, which I may not have time to explain today. So managers are different. What has been happening? Uh, if we just get managers and no manager workers, now there are more managers than workers in the economy, relatively speaking. Okay, manager rate employment share has been rising. And then the average wage of managers has been rising relative to uh, no manager workers. In some sense, the second fact is not that surprising because we often talk about how the Fortune 500 CEOs are making so much more money, but our data comes from census and ACS, so this, this is a top coded, so we're not talking about uh, Tim Cook making a lot of money. We're kind of talking about a lot of different managers whose income is uh, top, earnings are top coded. But the fact is here. So if you look at the blue line, this is the, in the aggregate, regardless of sect sectors, what, uh, is this is manager wage premium. So it's dividing, simply dividing manager worker, uh, manager compensation by no manager worker compensation and take the average, average ratio of the averages. And it has been about 45% in 1980. Now it's about 90%. Okay. And then if you look at red line, that's the right axis. Uh, what fraction of workers are managers? It used to be about a little bit more than 11%. Now uh, it actually is 13 and a half. The peak was in 2005. So there's something about the crisis doing something to this structure, but uh, we just used 2010 yeah, census data. Okay, so by sector, I think this is kind of interesting, but by sector, I think this is even more interesting. This is this, what, what we call vertical polarization because we think of managers and worker hierarchy. Uh, this has been stronger in man manufacturing. So this is what fraction of worker, uh, people working are managers in each sector. The blue is ma manufacturing, where is services. So in manufacturing, the manager the share of employment in manufacturing has been rising very steeply. Uh, it was rising a little bit in services. It's mostly manufacturing. And then manager wage by sector is, again, same. It's all driven by, it's mostly driven by manufacturing. So manufacturing managers making about 60% more than manufacturing workers in 1980. Now the premium is about 140%. Services, yes, managers are on average earning even more than service workers over time, but the rise is not as much as in manufacturing. So these three facts, cluster of facts, so just the, what we call to distinguish from this vertical polarization, this general polarization, horizontal polarization by auto and company, structure change, and this new facts on managers and non-manager workers, uh, these are the things that we we'll think about using this new framework. Okay, so let me start with the model. Um, so for the purpose of this theoretical discussion, I will talk about four occupations only. There's a manager occupation and there are three worker occupations. When we actually go to the calibration and uh, structural estimation part, in some sense, we'll talk about one manager occupation and 10 worker occupations. The model actually really easily extends to uh, more occupations and even more sectors, but we'll uh, stick to simpler ones in the theoretical derivation at least. So people in this economy, has a two-dimensional vectors. Again, as I said, people have different skills, but we distinguish the skills of the managers and skills of worker. So Z is the managerial talent of the person, and H is his efficiency units of labor as a non-manager worker. Okay. And then these things are not really sector specific. And then we're gonna assume that H, that's the non-manager worker efficiency units, that's not gonna depend on, that's not specific to a particular occupation you are using. So it's fairly tractable, two-dimensional uh, skill space. And then people choose based on their competitive advantage as a manager versus worker. They will actually sort into manager jobs and worker jobs. And there are, in this theoretical part, we're gonna have three worker occupations indexed by J, J for job. So there's index zero, zero, one, two. Think of it as a kind of low skill, middle skill, high skill, or manual, routine, and abstract jobs. Okay, and then there are two sectors, manufacturing and services, they produce different goods, and how are they really different? The key is the assumption that sectors combine different occupations uh, differently, or 
the correct way to say is that some manufacturing will be more intensely using uh, routine worker task, J equal one, and service on the other hand will use more managers uh, in the production. So, and that's backed by the data which I have in the uh, appendix of the slides actually. So that's what sec how sectors are different. So let's talk about, so manager versus worker is simple. So you have a high Z relative H, then you become manager. You have a high H relative to Z, then you become a worker. That's fine. And then, but there are three different work occupations. How should we think about it? So what we want at the end is have a positive sorting of workers based on this H into occupations of different skill contents. So in this simple, we're going to have three zero, one, two, or manual routine abstract worker jobs. So the manual job is really low skill in the sense that you bring your age, well, it doesn't really matter. We just need the bodies, okay? So regardless of your age, you will contribute the H bar to the production of that occupation specific output. And the routine jobs are you bring age and that's exactly how you contribute to the production of that occupation output or task. And the abstract job, you bring H, only H minus chi will be used. So one way to think of it is the really easy things you know, the chi part, we don't really use for production. Or well, another way to think of it is that these jobs are complex that you show up in the morning, the job contents change, so you have to spend some time figuring, okay, what's my job today? So that's one way to think about it. But all we want is positive sorting of workers uh, into different occupations of different skill contents based on their age. So we could have any kind of super modularity that will work. This just makes our aggregation easy and th theoretical derivations is, uh, is neat because of this assumption. Okay, so this is a fairly complicated slide. So let me try to focus what I think is sort of important. So at the worker level, you are an occupation zero. This is how you produce. This is H bar is what each person brings because again, we don't care about your H, it's just H bar. And then this is um, the second worker occupation where you bring your H that gets combined with the capital and then it gets produced. And then this is the abstract job, a high skill job where you bring H, you lose a little bit of uh, chi there. But um, yeah, that's how you produce. And the key is M0, M1, M2. These are occupation specific TFPs. And, for our analysis, this is the key driver of the economy. When we say routinization, what we mean actually in the model is that the occupation specific TFP of this routine worker jobs, that grows faster than the other occupation specific TFPs. When workers produce each occupation task, that first gets combined together. This is all worker level task combined, and sigma will be less than one, meaning that the different worker occupation tasks are complements. And then this is how those worker tasks are combined. That's the weight. And then we're gonna assume that manufacturing has high of a new uh, M1, M for manufacturing, then uh, services, new of S1, where J equal one means this routine jobs. And then there's a managerial task produced using your own managerial talent. And then finally, at the establishment level, and it's the, at the, finally, at at the establishment level, the manufacturing and manager's task and worker task are combined with some weight, and there's another elasticity parameter omega, and that's gonna be less than one. So managerial output and worker output are complements too. And then services will have, have high ADA, means that service tends to use more managers as in the data than uh, manufacturing does actually. Okay. So, the pictures, that's the setup of the model. Actually, let me show you how the allocation or assignment of workers in this two-dimensional space work in one sector, and then I extend towards sec, uh, two-sector model, and it will be short. Okay, so this Z and H plane, so this is a, people are distributed over this plane, so everybody has this two-dimensional vector. And then the two orange bars, so Z is managed, the people who choose to be managers, and H, are the people who choose to be workers, and then the two orange bars show positive sorting among workers. If you're a worker, okay, the low, real, low H guys become this uh, manual workers because again, your H doesn't matter. So if you're really low H, then you will get H bar worth of the service, so that's good. And then if you better have enough high H, enough of a H to pro, uh, join and produce um, 
the abstract test because there's a fixed cost component to it. Okay? So people get sorted positively based on their age. And then this is the comparative advantage between worker and managers. And one thing that uh, should be obvious is that in this worker occupation, people get paid exactly the same regardless of their age because they are all contributing age bar. So uh, the occupation choice between manager and wor manual worker part is flat because workers, uh, they are paid exactly the same regardless of age. So this is one sector model. And now I'm going to do one thing here, comparative static. So we talked about the occupations have a different occupation specific tier of P processes. And I'm going to assume that all the other things are equal, just increase the, manif uh, the routine jobs occupation specific tier P. So the guys producing this task suddenly they become productive overnight. What happens? It depends on what we assumed about the complementarity between worker outputs and also complementary between the manager and worker output altogether. So think of a Leon TF. Suddenly these guys become produce. Now, because of the Leon TF production function across worker tasks, you have too much of these routine jobs. What do you do? You send some of the workers over to the manual jobs and abstract jobs. And again, to assume Leon TF between managers and com extreme complementary between managers and workers, now suddenly the workers over are more productive. There's more of a worker output, not enough for manager tasks. What do you do? Well, you kind of send some of the workers to manage occupation. So if the only thing that changes is the TFP of this manual worker jobs actually increase, this is what we get. Okay? What it is is the shrinking of this middle level worker jobs and also expansion of managerial class okay? just with one thing happening. This is employment polarization and also the vertical polarization in terms of employment share between managers and workers. And wage works the same because, you know, I mean, the summit is equivalent to decentralized economy. So they're thinking about sending some of these guys over to different occupation. You have to pay them more, so their income is higher. Uh, that's why they change the occupation. And then the other guys who didn't change the occupation just benefit from the increase in the return to their managerial or worker skills. So this gets employed, qualitatively gets employment share and wage polarization, just with one thing happening at the level of uh, middle occupation. So, so now this is what the map, occupation choice map looks like in the two dimensional, uh, two sector model. So blue is manufacturing, red is services. And then of course, for now you have this manual worker, some of them work in services, some of them, others work in manufacturing. Same for abstract workers, some abstract workers work in services, others work in manufacturing. And same for managers. Some managers work in manufacturing and services. And we are assuming that individuals do not care which sector they work in because they will be compensated exactly the same. Okay? It's just equilibrium of that. Okay. So what's going to happen is with the two sectors, it just adds one thing, but it's pretty simple. Uh, once I explain what the one sector model does when the routinization or the increase in TFP of the middle scale worker task actually um, TFP goes up. So what we already knew that holding people working in each sector constant for now and just kind of increase the middle level worker TFP, work, uh, occupation TFP, then you see basically the same picture happening in both manufacturing services at the same time. One final loop we impose is that manufacturing service outputs are complements. So what it means is that now, again, think about Leon TF again, because manufacturing relies more on this routine worker task, although this TFP change at this occupation level is not sector specific because manufacturing has a higher loading on that uh, particular occupation in TFP, manufacturing TFP endogenously rises faster than services. Overall, if you have a complementary, uh, complement, uh, if manufacturing service has a complement, now you have too much manufacturing goods relative to service goods. So what do you do? You kind of kick off people from manufacturing to services. So that's one final loop. In some sense, it's not the final loop because, so what we did is that just increase the routine level occupation space TFP, that's not set of specific, we get polarization across workers and polarization between managers and workers in terms of employment share of wages. On top of that, we get uh, structure change, sending more managers to work, uh, people from man uh, manufacturing to services. One thing we kind of like about this model compared to um, 
Other models of structural change that relies on exogenous differences in sector level TFP growth is that in those models, if some sector TFP grows faster than other sector TFP, in the limit, the fastest TFP growing sector vanishes. Okay? In our model, what vanishes is not the sector, but actually is the occupation. So if the only thing that's happening is the middle level worker task TFP is increasing faster and faster and faster and faster, asymptotically, the employment share actually of that occupation disappears. But once that occupation disappears, now there's no difference between manufacturing and services, and hence the two sector has a stable uh, sizes. Okay. One joke is that we look at the uh, calibrated part, manager TFP, manager specific TFP is the lowest growing one. So in the limit, everybody will be managers. And there's uh, no one, yeah, will be all independent contractors. Yeah. Okay. So quantitative analysis in the limited time I have, uh, the idea is this. So the, we have enough parameters, enough moments for 1980 US economy at this level of aggregation. And what we're going to do is that from that on, the only thing that changes are constant growth in occupation level TFPs. Okay? So occupation TF is growing at constant rate. Of course, in the data, it's not growing constantly, but we assume that it's growing constant at a constant rate. And then on top of that, we have sector-specific uh, sector technological change that affects all the occupations uh, in the same way on top of that. Okay? So, so what we have right now will be decomposition exercise. So let me tell you one thing. So the literature structural change, typically think of a structural change that's driven by sector-specific TFP uh, process. So what you see here is that the black line, this is implement share in services. It goes from 67% to about 80%, so about 13 percentage point change in the increase in service share in employment. So blue dotted line with the X, what it is is that in our model, fully calibrated model, we shut down the sector-specific TFP change, which is the essence of the structural change in literature, and we still generate a lot of structural change, I mean, shifting workers from services to man uh, manufacturing to services by an increase of about about 8 percentage points. There's about 60 percent explanation of the actual 13 percent change. And the idea is this picture, basically. Okay. When you have um, manufacturing, there's sector neutral occupation specific TFP change, but manufacturing uses more of these guys. So manufacturing TFP grows faster, and that leads to structural change. So it doesn't have to be sector specific technical change. So in our analysis, kind of doing horse race of task specific or occupation specific technical change and sector specific technical change, what we see is that a lot of it is just most of the fact that we are interested in gets explained by occupation specific technological change rather than sector specific technological change. Okay? So, one thing I want to say is that to uh, wrap up the discussion is that it's okay. So, we kind of compute the bars up the percentage point increase per year in the TFP of each occupation okay, between 1980 and 2015. So this comes from our model when we use it as an accounting device. So what you see is that some of the occupations, like administrative support, machine operators, and transportation, and then uh, mining and precision workers, and then there's uh, mechanics and construction, they see a lot of TFP increase. So these occupations actually kind of becoming much more efficient. And in our model, that's why they lose their employment share and the relative wage actually falls because of that, because of the complementary infrastructure. So then the question is that, does it correlate with anything? Uh, one thing we used to talk a lot about is skill bias technological change, where skill typically is understood as something related to college, and you kind of see that there's a pretty weak relationship. And if you kind of take the skill bias technological change real literally, that benefits high skilled workers, technical change that benefits high skilled workers a lot, uh, we actually get negative correlation with actually measured TFP increase at the occupation level. We measured meaning through the lens of the model. So it doesn't seem to be a pretty, it doesn't seem to be a promising explanation. So of course, if you just look at college and non-college uh, workers, that if that's the level of disaggregation, then of course, skill bias technology change makes a lot of sense. But what we are saying is that you break down into different occupation and each occupation have both non-skilled and high, highly skilled workers measured by college or non-college. Uh, and then that occupation change structure uh, is not explained by skill bias technological change. It's too broad a stroke of explanation. 
And this is what RTI is in index that uh, Otto and Asimoglu use in the handbook chapter. And that in their hypothesis is that this routine, high routinizable, this is the red, high routinizable uh, occupations must see high T of P uh, changes. It is in some sense true that there's positive correlation, but it's not as tight. What we actually show is that if you look at, look at a this earlier level of this uh, occupation specific uh, characteristic, something, two things actually really pop out in terms of how well it explains the occupation level TFP that our model kind of comes up with. One thing is that it's not just a routine index, but if you look at subcategory of routine index, there's something called routine manual. So occupation TFP increase highly correlated with correlation eight to four with um, this routine manual characteristic of occupation. And then it is very strongly correlation minus 0.8, strongly negatively correlated with this manual interpersonal skill. This is basically saying how much of a job actually requires you understanding other people. So that's the interpersonal skill. So as you can see, managers have to really understand other people. If you are like a machine operator, you really don't understand, understand other people. So we think these are the components that really explain the technological change at the occupation level, which in turn explain a lot of changes in the labor market in the US over the last 30 years. So let me finish with just one more picture. Given that we have a model, we didn't talk about any dynamics, we can actually work out the uh, long run dynamics. So what's happening is that, let's assume that some occupations are easier to improve with TFP. That's the routine jobs. But in the model, if those things become productive, more and more productive, their employment share actually decreases. So what's happening in the model is that, well, the occupation, some occupations have a high TFP growth, but those are shrinking, meaning that overall, their overall contribution to the aggregate TFP increase actually is falling over time. Okay? The most productive occupation is actually shrinking. So here, the blue, black line is a log GDP per capita. So if things are growing at a constant rate, you should see a straight line because it's log. But in this model, if you kind of look at the asymptotics, it actually is concave, meaning the growth rate is actually slowing. So we think this may be a one way to think about uh, the often talked about circular stagnation, where the growth rate of um, GDP per capita actually is falling over time. So it's a technology-based uh, explanation. Then, okay, so let me actually conclude. So we kind of propose a, a different kind of model to macro. It's a task-based, but Unlike other task-based models, we kind of think about managers being separate from workers, and there's two-dimensional uh, assignment models. So that's, in some sense, it has interest in on its own. And then we show that we have just routinization. Some middle-level worker tasks have higher occupation-specific TFP growth, and that explains worker-level polarization, polarization between managers and workers, and also structural change. And then this routinization that we find in the model are really tightly correlated with the job characteristic in terms of routinization, uh, manual, uh, manual, uh, manual routine index of each job, and then also the interpersonal skills requirement of each job. Okay. So that's all I have today. Thank you.